Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Monica Bargava. I'm one of the pulmonary and critical care physicians here at Highland Hospital in Oakland. I'm thrilled to chat with you a little bit about sedation in the ICU. It's a topic that comes up a lot because it's maybe one of the few places in the hospital where we purposely give medications to reduce people's level of consciousness. And it's a good idea to be familiar with what's out there and why we use certain agents and not others. Okay, so why do we sedate patients? And that's a really good question. So ICU care often involves very painful or agitating circumstances, including putting an endotracheal tube down your throat, putting in various uh, vascular lines, the patient is immobile, they can't eat or drink, there's a loss of homeostasis. So all of this is very problematic for the patient and can cause distress. So very quickly, the definition of sedation, they are agents which reduce the level of consciousness and limit response to external stimuli. The benefits of sedation, as I mentioned earlier, is that the patient can tolerate intensive care and procedures. The potential costs, however, are manifold, and they include hypotension and other hemodynamic compromise, delirium, and increased stays on the ventilator. For most ICU patients, we do try to limit the total amount of sedation given because a high sedative load is generally linked to poorer outcomes. It's linked to, again, as I mentioned, uh, increased days on the ventilator and even increased mortality. The general strategy for dealing with patients in the ICU, so let's say you've intubated them um, and you think that they might have an underlying source of pain somewhere. So general principles recommend that we focus on analgesia first and that we assess pain and try to treat the pain first. However, if agitation or a heightened unpleasant awareness exists in the patient, even after you've given analgesia, you then want to try some non-pharmacologic means to reduce distress. So I know you've all been very familiar with some things we can do to reduce distress in the ICU that don't involve drugs. So it includes things like ensuring sleep for your patient, ensuring that they are exposed to adequate daylight and that at nighttime it's dark, also reducing noise, um, talking to your patients, telling them where they are, what day it is, having family member visits, all of those things are, are very helpful. However, if all of these non-pharmacologic approaches don't really work, we then turn to goal-directed pharmacologic sedation. So I'd like to review a table of analgesics and sedatives with you so we can all familiarize ourselves with what's out there. Okay, so here's a table from a review in the New England Journal of Medicine. It came out a few years ago, but I still find it pretty relevant, so I like to review it uh, with the residents and with anyone who's interested. So let me see if I can expand this a little bit. All right. Let's start out with a drug that we've all heard and used. It's midazolam, also known as Versed. It's a GABA agonist. It can be given as a bolus or an infusion. This is a sedative. Its half-life is up to 11 hours, but it's usually fairly rapid on, rapid off in terms of its effects. It's metabolized by the liver, and there's also renal excretion, so you may have to factor those things in if you prescribe it. The adverse effects, however, there's possibly a higher risk of delirium. And in general, you know, many years ago, it was the go-to sedative in the ICU, but increasingly we are choosing other agents simply because of the delirium risk associated with benzodiazepines. Another agent we sometimes use in the ICU is Ativan, also a GABA agonist. It can be given as a bolus or an infusion. It has a slower onset and a longer half-life, and it's metabolized by hepatic glucuronidation. One thing I wanted to notice about Ativan, I wanted all of us to recognize this, is that it's not typically used as a drip in the ICU for routine sedation, simply because its half-life is significant, and it's not a very fast-on, fast-off agent. We do sometimes use it in patients with severe alcohol withdrawal, and I'm sure we've all taken care of people that we've put on an Ativan drip for that. Again, higher risk of delirium because it's a benzodiazepine.
Valium, so this is something we don't use too often in the ICU because, again, its half-life is quite long. It's a GABA agonist. It can be given as a bolus. Its half-life, it can be up to 120 hours, so it sticks around quite a bit. I can't say we use it a fair amount in the ICU, but it's good to know about and to be familiar with its mechanism of action. The next drug is the sedative we use most frequently in the ICU, and it's called propofol. It's a GABA agonist, and it has other effects, including glutamate and cannabinoid receptor activity. We usually give it as a drip, about 1 to 3 milligrams per kilograms per hour. Its half-life is 30 to 60 minutes. One thing I should note is that propofol does accumulate in a person's fat stores. So if someone's been on propofol for a long time, you know, like a week or two, and then you turn it off, it might take a while before that patient wakes up. We all know that there are a lot of side effects associated with propofol, however. In general, we do prefer it to Versed because it's less deliriogenic, but that's not to say it doesn't have side effects of its own. Propofol also causes significant vasodilatation and negative inotropy, which is why we tend to avoid it in patients with severe heart failure. A very rare side effect described is propofol infusion syndrome, which consists of lactic acidosis, arrhythmia, and cardiac arrest. And it's mostly associated with prolonged infusion rates um, over long periods of time. Heavy propofol usage is also associated with hypertriglyceridemia and pancreatitis, so you do need to track your triglycerides while your patient is on this drug. The next, I would say, most used sedative in our ICU is Presidex, and the, tr the uh, generic is dexmedetomidine. It's an alpha-2 agonist, and it's given as a drip. Its half-life is up to two hours. It doesn't accumulate with prolonged infusion, and it is metabolized by hepatic glucuronidation. We really like Presidex, and the reason we like it is that it relaxes our patient, but it does not affect respiratory drive. So that makes it a very unique sedative and an important one in many ways, especially when you're trying to extubate someone and you'd like them to be breathing on their own. The side effects I've seen most often include hypotension and bradycardia. This article also describes transient hypertension, but I can't say I've actually seen that. Okay, so those are the, the major sedatives that we use. I would like to move on to some of the agents that we use for analgesia because sedation and analgesia often go together. So remifentanil or Altiva, it's a very, very short-acting opioid agonist. It's not really something we use in the ICU. Its half-life is three to four minutes. It is used in the OR, but it's good to be familiar with it, but again, probably not something you'll use in our ICU. Fentanyl is an opioid agonist. We can give it as bolus dosing or a drip. Its half-life is up to six hours. It is fat-soluble, so it can accumulate with prolonged infusion and something to, to think about. Again, metabolized by the liver. And it has a fair amount of the standard narcotic side effects, including nausea, constipation, respiratory, depression. But again, fentanyl is the most common analgesic used in the ICU. Morphine we're all familiar with. Um, it's also an opioid agonist, can be given in bol as a bolus dose, and occasionally as a drip. Now, we, we don't usually use a morphine drip as routine analgesia in the ICU. We usually use it for comfort care patients because its half-life is three to seven hours. It does stick around, and it provides a longer-lasting pain relief. It is not a quick-on, quick-off kind of drug if you give it as a drip, so we don't routinely use it. It can cause the typical narcotic side effects, including nausea and respiratory depression. What's interesting about morphine is that it can cause histamine release and subsequent hypotension and itchiness. So if someone has severe asthma, for instance, we might be cautious in giving them morphine. Next up is dilaudid or hydromorphone, also an opioid agonist. It can be given as a bolus or a drip. Its half-life is up to 3.5 hours. Its key quality is that it is 7 to 11 times as potent as morphine, also metabolized by hepatic glucuronidation. I would say we don't routinely put people on dilaudid drips in the ICU unless they're comfort care. Folks might be on dilaudid PCAs after surgery. 
but again, we don't sort of use it as standard analgesia in drip form. Fentanyl drip is usually the most popular option. Okay, moving along. So which sedative is best? We've you know discussed all of these sedatives and they all have pluses and minuses, but there are a lot of components to deciding on which sedative is, is the best match for the patient. So I would say number one is the depth of sedation desired. If you want someone lightly sedated, you might pick something like Presidex. If you want someone very deeply sedated, you might choose something more like propofol. In addition, you want to consider the patient's underlying conditions. If they have severe anxiety, for instance, they might do a little bit better with a benzodiazepine-based regimen. You want to consider concomitant hemodynamic issues and organ failure issues when you're choosing your sedatives and analgesics. For instance, if someone's in severe heart failure, we tend to avoid propofol because of its negative inotropic effects. You also want to take into account the pharmacokinetics of the drug. If you want long-lasting pain relief on a patient, you might not put them on something that is um, very short-acting, for instance. Okay, let me run you through some examples of regimens, and you may remember this from either your prior ICU experience or your residency. So starting off, heart failure. So let's say you're you know, in the ER, someone comes in with heart failure, they've been intubated. Usually we will put them on some fentanyl for pain, simply because having an endotracheal tube in and lines in, all of this is uncomfortable. We tend to avoid propofol because it's a negative inotrope. If they have ongoing agitation or movement, we might try a Presidex strip or Versed PRN. You could ultimately do a Versed drip if someone is very agitated, but again, we try to avoid it because Versed is found to be one of the most deliriogenic sedatives that we give. Okay, so the next scenario is basic septic shock. Usually, again, we start with a fentanyl drip for pain if they've been intubated. If they seem persistently agitated, a propofol drip is okay for sedation, as long as the hemodynamics can take it and the patient doesn't have severe ongoing heart failure. Presidex and or Versed are also options for sedation in this situation. The third situation I wanted to mention in particular because of our current public health crisis is a COVID patient with sepsis and ARDS. So of course we would give fentanyl drip for pain if they, they will likely require sedation. We try to avoid propofol because these patients can develop viral myocarditis during their course and that could affect their ejection fraction. So in general, we try to avoid propofol. If they seem to have ongoing agitation, we can try Presidex or Versed. We may have to keep these patients deeply sedated since they will be doing a number of intensive procedures to them and they will likely undergo proning and paralysis. Whenever we choose a sedative, a very important thing to consider is how much do we give? Sedation with a target is very important. There are a number of scales we can use to measure how sedated a patient is, but the most common one, or the one that I think is most intuitive, is the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, or the RAS score. Many of you are familiar with this. A score of four means the patient is highly combative, Score of negative five means the patient cannot be aroused. In general, we try to aim for most ICU patients to be at a RAS of zero or negative one. Again, we're trying to use as little sedation as possible over the course of the patient's hospitalization because very high levels of sedation are linked to poorer outcomes. However, there are very clear situations where someone may need to be deeply sedated. For instance, if they have ongoing seizure activity, if they've had recent neurologic surgery, um, if they're being prone and paralyzed, all of this will require a deeper level of sedation and you may aim for a negative three or a, even a negative four. But this is a, a table we should all be familiar with. The next question is weaning off of sedation. How do we get people off once we put them on? In general, our patients should undergo a daily spontaneous awakening trial, if at all possible. Now again, patients with a strong medical indication for sedation, we shouldn't do this to those patients. But for other folks, we should be lifting sedation daily 
to get a good neurologic exam and to see how responsive they are. The concept of daily sedation interruption is considered important because giving high levels of continuous sedation for days on end is linked to poorer outcomes. If the patient is going to have a spontaneous breathing trial that day, you may want to turn sedation to the lowest possible setting that is tolerable for the patient. If the patient is still agitated, you don't need to just crank up their old sedative. You could try adding Presidex if they're not already on it because this does not depress the respiratory drive. It might allow them to be lightly relaxed as they're being extubated. So all of this is not particularly straightforward. It can be a little more complex. So please feel free to ask your respiratory therapist, your ICU nurse, and your pulmonary critical care colleagues for input. We are here to answer your questions. So in summary, ICU patients are in general uncomfortable. So we should always address pain first. We should then turn to non-pharmacologic means to reduce distress and agitation if possible. The next step is pharmacologic sedation. The choice of sedative agent depends on the depth of, depth of sedation desired, the patient's physiology and hemodynamics, as well as their organ dysfunction. Daily evaluation of sedation goals, monitoring for delirium, and daily sedation interruption, if possible, is recommended to give your patient the greatest chance of success. Thank you so much for listening. Here are some references you might find useful, including the New England Journal Review article.